already kind of discussed this. We started recording here. So um, if you could quickly also type in the chat what your um, interests are in today's webinar. Is it personal use, professional, or both? Um, and that's also helpful for us too, just to kind of get a feel. And I'm going to keep moving on so we can stay on um, track. So what we're going to talk about today are um, the past and current trends in substance use and how they inform harm reduction practices in the community, health and social benefits of harm reduction programming. Um, we're going to look at different myths. Obviously, there's a lot of myths about harm reduction, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, and that's why you're with us today, just to kind of clarify what the truth is. Um, we're going to talk about the benefits of and evidence behind different approaches, including naloxone, syringe access, fentanyl test strips. And then I'm um, talking about strategies that can reduce stigma and engage um, patients and community members in um, substance use disorder care. So I'm going to um, ask for your participation. Um, I want you to look at these different tools that I have here. Um, so you can see um, we have a bike helmet, we have a seat belt, we have a fire hydrant, um, not hydrant, um, fire extinguisher, and then we have Gardasil, so that's the um, HPV vaccine. So if you could think about these things, if you could either unmute or put in the chat, what do these tools have in common? So I'm seeing, um, I can't see the chat while I'm presenting, but um, Mary Jo, um, what, are, what are folks saying about these tools? They all reduce harm, protective elements, um, safety, um, ability to prevent harm. So very similar, let's see, protection, public safety. So yeah, great. Perfect. Um, so that is great. I appreciate that. Um, so these are, these are accepted approaches to really mitigating harm, right? Like um, when we are talking about these things, they're kind of the sort of things where we use them regularly. We don't question it. We know that if we needed them, they would help us and they could potentially save our life, right? So we also know that there's data to back the use of these things. So we know that since seatbelts got invented, people's lives have been saved. Maybe we even know somebody whose life has been saved because of a seatbelt. Um, do we think we're gonna get a, in a car accident every time we get in our car? Certainly not. I, I would have a hard time living if that were the case. Obviously I have my moments in some traffic, but um, in general, we still use them, right? Like I hope that I don't have a fire in my kitchen. But if I ever did, I do have a fire extinguisher, right? Um, so I'm not living in fear, but I have these things because we know that they can save our lives, they can save our property. Helmets, of course, if somebody is riding a bike and get hit by a car, the outcomes are not very good for them if they have a head injury. However, the outcomes improve so much more if they're wearing a helmet. So these are things that, you know what? At the very beginning of using these things, people were probably skeptical, right? Um, there were probably people that said, oh, I'm not gonna wear a seat belt and, you know, they're still out there. But um, in general, we use these things because we know they can save our life. And we know we have data that backs them. We even have policies in some cases that back these and recommendations because we have um, lots of people that have done research on what are the benefits of these things. And we know that they benefit people individually. But by and large, when we use them in the population, they can save a lot of lives. Um, and they also can save a lot of money for the healthcare system, right? So Gardasil is a vaccine that's for the HPV vaccine, um, um, HPV virus. Um, and this can cause cancers, especially cervical cancer. And so um, if somebody's given this vaccine, that could prevent cancer and potentially death, right? So these are some examples of more accepted harm reduction tools. Um, now we have some other photos here. These are things that are also harm reduction tools, um, also shown to save lives also shown um, backed by data, backed by evidence. However, these things are a little less accepted, unfortunately. So I have um, a photo here of Narcan nasal spray. Um, so Narcan nasal spray is an incredibly safe drug, so much so that the FDA is now recommending that it's um, over the counter. So it, it will be over the counter later this summer. So that's one example. Why is there any hesitation around a drug that has so few side effects? So Nasal dryness is a side effect for um, Narcan nasal spray. Um, and yet it can save somebody's life. And yet we know it saves lots of lives. So what is the controversy around naloxone? Why are there healthcare providers and pharmacists? So I'm a pharmacist. Um, I didn't really do an introduction, but <laughs> um, I am a pharmacist. I work at the University of Minnesota College of Pharmacy in Duluth. So I can I can talk about healthcare um, 
professional stigma um, with confidence because I am one and I work with these populations. And I can tell you that there is unfortunately stigma around naloxone within our healthcare professional community. Um, they're hesitant to prescribe it. They're hesitant to um, dispense it. And hopefully that's changing, but it is very disconcerting. Also stigma around accessing treatment for substance use disorders is a huge problem within our healthcare professional community. So the stigma um, is really what's keeping people from accepting evidence-based practices. Another picture I have here, uh, that's fentanyl test strips. So this is another tool that um, basically this allows somebody to test their drug supply for fentanyl so it can actually change their behavior. Um, we found people that use fentanyl test strips are more likely to um, adapt their substance use um, patterns. So if they know there's fentanyl in their drug supply, they'll likely use less of the drug, um, thus preventing overdose. They've actually found that people that use harm reduction, um, such as fentanyl test strips, are more likely to enter treatment. So that's pretty interesting. And then we also have a photo here, needle exchange saves lives. Um, this is another evidence-based strategy that we're going to talk about today. Um, unfortunately, all these things um, are controversial um, largely, I wouldn't say in all circles, but they can be, and they really shouldn't be because we have the same sort of data and evidence that supports these practices as we do for the things on this screen, right? But what's the difference between people accepting these things versus these things? It's stigma, stigma around substance use. So, um, so let's talk about what is harm reduction. So some of you had some very good uh, definitions. Um, I'm going to give you definitions that align with what you already said. So very simply, it's doing things that make it safer for people to participate in activities that could lead to harm, but really they're unrealistic to ban or eliminate. Um, so ex for example, can we realistically eliminate contacting other people? Probably not. So we have vaccines, right? Because we know that viruses and um, vaccine preventable illness spreads from being around other people and we don't want to give that up, right? So we have vaccines. Um, we also know going out in the sun is a lot of fun. It's healthy for us. Like we like to be outside. Sometimes our jobs require it. That's how we spend our leisure time. So we have sunscreen because we know that um, exposure to the sun can be dangerous and can also cause cancer. Driving. We Most of us don't stay at home all the time. We are either in a car that we're driving, someone else is driving, maybe a bus. We have seatbelts. Um, we even have them in airplanes because we go places. Um, and then we also have um, condoms because people have sex, right? <laughs> and so there's an ad here um, that the makers of Trojan condoms were kind of, um, we thought, kind of clever. So on this ad, it says at the top, I didn't use one because I didn't have one with me. Um, so that was the excuse some people say, um, maybe about not using a condom. And then it says, get real. If you don't have a parachute, don't jump. <laughs> um, so, so condoms are another thing we have to reduce risk. So these things are by and large accepted. Um, we use vaccines, we use sunscreen, we use seatbelts, we use condoms. And again, um, why are these other harm reduction strategies different? So harm reduction is really for activities that are difficult to ban or eliminate um, that could cause harm. And why are we talking about harm reduction in substance use specifically? Um, as you all know, we have a crisis at hand, and this isn't even the most recent data, but I can assure you the most recent data looks exactly like this with the trends continuing. Um, so this is a figure that has national drug-involved overdose deaths, um, and this is among all ages, and um, it shows, um, it actually divides it up with total and then female and male. And so you can see, um, and this starts with 1999 on the left and 2020 on the right. And we can basically see how the total number of overdose deaths has continued to climb from 1999 until 2020. Um, and it's gone up since then as well. Um, so the total number keeps going up steadily. The male number is consistently above the female number, keeps going up. Um, the female number actually went down, I think, between 2017 and 2019, but then it went up again. So basically what we're seeing is more and more people dying of unintentional drug poisoning. And we can talk about these different waves. Um, why is this happening? Um, more recently, we're seeing, and this this is all um, since fentanyl's been on the market, we're seeing some spikes, but we have a newer drug called xylazine now, and that is also taking people's lives. So um, this is older data, but we do know of all the overdose deaths since probably 2017, um, the vast majority of them involve an opioid. So there's different waves of the rise um, in opioid overdose deaths. 
So um, I have another graph here um, that shows the three major waves. Um, and I would say there's a fourth wave now that we have xylazine on the market. I haven't found a figure that captures that, but I think it's important to talk about these distinctions. So unfortunately, there are a lot of people that think, um, maybe less so now, but I would say even a year ago, a lot of folks were thinking that the op opioid crisis was all about pills um, that you'd get from your healthcare provider, and that is just not the case. So that is how it started. I would say the first wave in um, in the opioid overdose crisis was um, when we had a lot of prescribing and over-prescribing of opioids and the healthcare provider community didn't realize how addictive they were. Um, they just didn't realize it. They relied on very weak data. They didn't look for rigorous data and they just kept prescribing opioids, um, not realizing that people were definitely becoming dependent. Um, once they realized that was happening, unfortunately, we again, didn't look to data. <laughs> We thought, well, um, these people are addicted to opioids, so let's take them off the opioids. That will solve the problem. Um, that did not solve the problem because people were still dependent on that drug. Okay, so it wasn't a choice anymore. Their body became dependent on it. When we took away their opioid prescription and said, sorry, you're done, they were still dependent on an opioid and there's nothing they could do about it. They went into very severe withdrawals without that drug, without proper um, medication assisted treatment or proper tapering. And so what happened was people were dependent. They found that heroin would um, basically meet that opioid need in their body. Heroin's much cheaper than trying to obtain a prescription for opioids. And so we saw a rise in um, prescription opioid deaths that started in 1999. And then it was followed by a rise in heroin overdose deaths, which started in 2010. And that's because we didn't look at data and we didn't really um, do a good job in trying to figure out how to support these folks. Then we had the third wave starting in 2013. This is when we started to see synthetics like fentanyl um, introduced in the market. And since fentanyl has been introduced in the market, we have just seen the number of overdoses continue to skyrocket. Um, within the last year, we have another drug that isn't an opioid. Um, it's xylazine, not in the opioid class. It's actually an alpha-2 agonist, but it also causes sedation. It's called Trank or trank, yeah, um, it's also a sedative. And so when you combine those two things, they're deadly. So fentanyl on its own is deadly, but when you introduce another drug too, we've also found that people that um, pass away from an opioid overdose crisis very often have more than just an opioid on board. Um, usually it's an opioid in combination with another drug. So sometimes people intentionally take an opioid with another drug, like using a stimulant and a depressant at the same time would be called like speedballing. So people used to take like heroin, which is a downer with methamphetamine, which is an upper, or they take cocaine, which is an upper with an opioid, which is a downer. So now what we're seeing is that all of our drug supply is pretty much tainted with fentanyl. So even people that are methamphetamine users never intend on consuming an opioid. Their um, methamphetamine is um, laced with fentanyl. So we have people that are passing away from opioid overdose that never intended on having an opioid to begin with. So um, so that's kind of the background and the context with where we're at and kind of the state of our crisis. So we're going to look a little bit at the history now. So we, um, in the United States, our relationship with drug use started with Nixon's war on drugs in 1971. Um, it was an aggressive and expensive campaign that was aimed at curbing drug use, but really not a lot changed. Um, unfortunately, that approach didn't work. Um, you can see the history since the 70s. Um, this is a percent of high school seniors who are using drugs in the last month. And I haven't found a newer graph for this either, unfortunately, but it is about the same. Um, so teens, the most common age group to use drugs, show little net reduction in drug use since 1975, despite all this time and energy and focus we've spent on um, kind of scare tactics, honestly, not evidence-based. Again, that's another trend. We were using techniques that were not evidence-based um, because they seemed like a good idea. Um, and then access is another piece. So per the Office of National Drug Control policy, the prices of drugs have been falling. So between 1981 and 2007, the median bulk price of heroin fell 93%. So heroin became very cheap. At the same time, people who were addicted to their prescription painkillers were starting to get cut off. They were asked to taper too quickly. They were just flat out cut off. So now they have a very cheap alternative in the form of heroin, which is also an opioid. Um, it's not a legal opioid, but it is an opioid. And so it does satisfy that same part of the body, that brain, um, that dependence. 
Um, again, in the same time period, the price of cocaine fell and crack cocaine fell too. So we have very cheap alternatives on the market for people. Um, this effect where crackdowns on drug production in one area shift it to another is called the balloon effect. So we see that as well. Um, and that's very often cited as an explanation for trends in drug availability, despite this rigorous war on drugs that we have in the United States. Now, um, another thing we need to talk about, um, again, we are already identified that stigma is just a huge problem in people, um, in any progress we're making, honestly, as a country towards addressing substance use. Um, and there's also a lot of misconceptions. So there's also, um, this misconception that people, once they start using drugs, they're never going to get better. They're just relapsing. Um, they're just always in and out of treatment. Um, and it really, so it's really helpful to kind of look at the, what does the data say, right? Because that's what we're trying to do. So we looked at data and the relapse rates for substance use disorders is actually right on par with other diseases such as hypertension and asthma between 40 and 60%. Um, so the substance use disorder relapse rate, approximately 40 to 60, um, hypertension relapse rate, 50 to 70, and asthma relapse rate, 50 to 70. Now, I have um, several children with asthma, so I'm very familiar with asthma medications more than I'd like to be. Um, and I see a lot of parallels between asthma and substance use because in asthma, we have a controller medication. So that would be like your Flovent, your inhaled steroids. We are, if you have asthma, um, you are on those medications every day to keep your symptoms at bay. They're a controller. They try to keep the inflammation down. However, sometimes, despite our best efforts, things happen where we have an asthma exacerbation and our, um, we relapse. So maybe it's something like allergies. All of a sudden, it's a really bad year for allergies. Maybe it's something like smoke in the air, um, fires of, in another country blowing smoke. Um, and people with asthma end up having an exacerbation. Now, if I go in and I ask for um, albuterol, which is the rescue medication for asthma, thankfully, the people don't make me feel <laughs> like uh, inferior human being and they don't shame me for feeling like I'm um, a failure. But unfortunately, people with a substance use disorder, um, which is very similar. So people with a substance use disorder, there's medications to keep their symptoms at bay. It's called medications for opioid use disorder, right? So those are things like methadone and buprenorphine and suboxone. We have medications like that, but we also have naloxone, which is our um, rescue drug, right? So why is it that there is so much stigma around medications to keep substance use disorders sympt symptoms at bay and, and to treat that person and then naloxone, which is the rescue treatment, why is there such a difference between that and asthma? Um, and that is really, again, where we're seeing the effect of stigma in practice because they are similar in a lot of ways, similar relapse rates, um, a lot of similarities. So really, um, and with asthma, like nobody faults you if you need your albuterol inhaler, right? Like there, there's not stigma around that. So um, addressing substance use disorder relapse should be an expected part of the work. Um, and so we need to stop shaming people if they need to go back to treatment. We need to stop rolling our eyes when we say, oh, yep, they're in treatment for the eighth time. Like, thank goodness nobody's rolling their eyes at me if I have to bring my kid in for his asthma eight times, <laughs> which I have, because um, it's really hard to control. But unfortunately, we do that for people with substance use disorder. And I can tell you that um, working with people in recovery, I was a pharmacist working on a treatment court team, and it was really heartbreaking for me to see how poorly these folks were treated. And I'm fortunate to get to work with the recovery community um, and even work with people that are still using drugs in, a little more indirectly. And I can tell you they are still treated so horribly by our healthcare system and by our community. Um, so really, again, um, we need to think about stigma and shame. All of us really need to be taking a self inventory to think about how does stigma and shame impact our views of substance use disorder and what can we do to try to eliminate some of this stigma so that people can ask for help. Because substance use disorder, um, about 80% of people that have a substance use disorder will never get treatment. Imagine if that were the case for another condition. So. Again, um, unfortunately, eliminating drug use altogether seems more and more unrealistic. Considering this, harm reduction offers tools to reduce the harm that stems from substance use. So we're going to look at where are we today. So um, we're going to talk about a couple myths here. Um, so the first myth um, is harm reduction promotes harm to the community. Um, when in fact, uh, harm reduction programs are shown to be a cost-effective way to slow HIV. There's just a lot of data, so I'm going to. I don't want to get too hung up on it, but I do want to cover this. 
it has actually shown to reduce rates of HIV transmission in a community. Um, HIV is a big threat in the Midwest. Um, a lot of times people think that, that's, that it's a thing of the past. It's definitely not. We have um, an HIV outbreak in my area in Duluth. Um, it's really scary and problematic because HIV outbreaks can spread very quickly. Um, so harm reduction is so important. So again, um, it not, not only reduces HIV transmission, but also facilitates connections to program and support for people who use drugs, and they're actually more likely to enter treatment. Um, another myth is that harm, in, harm reduction only enables and increases drug use. This is also a myth. There's actually no connection between harm reduction and increased drug use. Um, and we know that harm reduction groups often offer used syringe disposal and hand out medical sharps containers. So their presence is often correlated with fewer discarded syringes in public spaces, such as parks and school campuses. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick pause. We've covered a lot of background data, um, myths and such. I'm gonna see if there's any questions in the chat and Mary Jo will give you a chance to um, take a peek and see, because we're going to move into naloxone next, but I don't want to move on if there's questions from the first part. Yeah, thanks, Laura. There are no questions in the chat unless I'm, I don't think I missed any, but if anyone wants to unmute and ask a question, please do. Otherwise, you can, can uh, put those in the chat too, and we'll I'll continue to track those. But if you have a question that you want to ask, please just unmute. Or I can also read it from the chat too, if you like that. Okay, well, I'll take another pause in a little bit, but I'm gonna keep moving for now. So um, one of the um, harm reduction tools that I've talked to a lot is, um, talked about a lot is naloxone. Um, so naloxone is the generic name for Narcan. Um, Narcan is basically the drug that reverses opioid overdose. Um, if you've been following the news at all lately, you've maybe seen that there's been a lot of attention to the fact that um, naloxone has now been recommended by the FDA to be shifted to over-the-counter, which is fantastic in my opinion. Um, I still have some concerns about accessibility because um, right now you can run it through insurance and sometimes when things move to over-the-counter, insurance won't cover them. So um, there are still some wrinkles to be um, figured out, but I think having it be available is always a good thing. So naloxone reverses overdose. Um, how it works, it's a high affinity mu receptor antagonist. So what does that mean? Um, basically, it means that naloxone um, binds to the same receptor as the opioid. So um, if somebody consumes opioids, the opioid, um, whether it be injected, inhaled, um, taken orally, the opioid ends up in the bloodstream, um, crosses into the brain and binds to this mu opioid receptor. Now, when the opioid binds to this mu opioid receptor in enough quantity, it basically turns down or turns off your body's desire to breathe. That's how it works and that's how it's deadly. Um, when you're not breathing, of course, your brain and vital organs are starved of oxygen and that is what is the deadly side effect of opioids. So um, if somebody gets naloxone, and naloxone can be injected or it can be sprayed into the nose where it gets absorbed in the blood vessels, either of those methods, it will still end up in the bloodstream, still end up in the brain, same thing as the opioid. However, it basically works by binding to that same receptor tighter than the opioid. So when the naloxone shows up in the brain, it essentially kicks the opioid off the receptor and binds in its place. Um, it's a great drug in that effect. Um, when the naloxone binds to the receptor, it doesn't send that same signal to the brain to slow breathing or stop breathing. Um, so when you get enough naloxone displacing the opioids, that person's desire to breathe comes back if it's given early enough. Um, now the important thing, um, so, th so we might give somebody naloxone and we can see them wake up, right? Like they look like their life is saved, that's fantastic. However, it's really important to know that the naloxone has a short half-life, which means it doesn't last in the body that long. Opioids, on the other hand, have a very long half-life. They live for a long time in the body. So what frequently happens is that naloxone wears off, the opioid is still there, it comes back and binds on that receptor and can um, cause another overdose. So we see people whose lives have been saved once from naloxone um, just to have another overdose occur once that naloxone wears off. So it's really, really important if you give somebody naloxone, they cannot be left alone. They should definitely be seen for medical care. Um, with fentanyl being on the market too, we're seeing a lot of people that require many doses of naloxone to keep them alive. We're talking like eight to 12 doses of naloxone if there's fentanyl. So um, it's important if you're in a rural area, um, we recommend people have more than one dose. There's different products. Um, the branded Narcan nasal spray is the most popular. We also have an injectable generic. 
Um, there was an auto injector got taken off the market. It was just far too expensive. Nobody used it. And then there's the injectable generic that's given intranasally. Um, there's different um, uh, ways to access naloxone in Minnesota. Lots of harm reduction agencies um, across the state, including Rural AIDS Action Network, Harm Reduction Sisters, Steve Rumler Hope Network. Um, we also ha have a state law where pharmacists can prescribe naloxone per protocol. They have to be trained for prescribing, screened um, for patient understanding and providing education. So um, another important point is um, in our state of Minnesota, I know not all of you are in, in Minnesota, but um, most states have their own version of a Good Samaritan law. So it's important for you to look up your own state legislation. But basically this is our Good Samaritan law called Steve's Law. So if two people are using drugs together, one person can call 911 for the other person and get medical assistance and care if they're experiencing overdose without being charged. So if I'm using drugs with my friend, that my friend experiences overdose, I can call 911. When they show up or the police show up, they're not gonna charge me with possession, sharing, or use of a controlled substance or um, drug paraphernalia. That is how this law works. Now, the exception that we've heard is that if somebody has a felony on their record, they can still be brought in. But if you don't have a felony on your record, you will not be charged. Um, we also have some myths and misconceptions about naloxone to talk about. Um, the first one is that naloxone is a controlled substance. This obviously isn't the case. It's actually going to be over the counter. But I think because naloxone works like an opioid, people might think that it's um, controlled. Even healthcare providers, I had a doctor question me on this. Um, they're like, you can't, you can't um, do this because it's controlled. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, it's not. Um, so there's a fair amount of um, myths and misconceptions around that. Um, there's also the myth that if you give somebody naloxone, they're going to be um, aggressive after you give it to them. And this, I think, is because of the phenomena, which I mentioned, called speedballing, where people might take an upper and a downer together. So somebody who's on cocaine, which is an upper, or methamphetamine, which is an upper, and fentanyl or heroin, like opioids are downers, right? If you take away the effect of the downer when you give them naloxone, you're going to see the effect of the upper on masks. So you're going to see somebody on cocaine and methamphetamine. So um, there's not automatically aggressive behavior after administration. That being said, um, a person can go into precipitated withdrawal, which is a very unpleasant state. They might be feeling sick. Um, they also might wake up and not know what is going on. If there's a bunch of people standing over them, there's police. They don't know what happened. Um, Another myth around naloxone is that there's going to be harm related to the administration of naloxone. Again, this is also a myth. Um, nasal dryness is the um, side effect of Narcan nasal spray. If you give somebody the injectable um, naloxone formulation, you can get an injection site reaction, much like a flu shot. So your arm could be sore, your leg could be sore. Um, I do think if people are using naloxone incorrectly, the um, injectable, like for example, if you inject somebody in a place that you've just heard is a good place, like in the neck, I've heard of that. That is, you could call, you could cause harm if you inject naloxone in the neck or through the chest, like um, things that people see in the movies. So it is important, I think, to, to do the naloxone training. And we have another webinar on that. Um, Mary Jo can share that link. Um, if you wanna get trained in naloxone specifically, there's a special training we do just for that. Um, that talks about the different dosage forms. So, but by and large, there's no um, harm from that drug specifically. It is very safe. That's why it's been recommended for over-the-counter status. There's also the myth that if you give somebody naloxone, you are enabling continued opioid misuse. This is, again, is also a myth. Um, there's no data that backs that. And then the myth of liability. Again, people are always worried about doing something that could cause somebody harm. Um, if you gave somebody the EpiPen and they didn't need it, you could cause harm with that, right? Um, and other drugs too, we'd never want to give somebody a drug that they don't need. However, um, naloxone, we don't have to worry about that. Um, okay, another quick pause. Um, so that, that ends our little section on naloxone. Are there any questions about naloxone specifically before we talk about syringe access programs? There's no questions in the chat, but please feel free to put any in there or unmute. Okay, seeing nothing. You can always ask later too. Um, we're going to talk about syringe access programs. Um, these can be called needle exchanges or syringe exchanges. They take in used syringes and dispose of them as medical waste. Um, again, there's a lot of evidence for this. Um, they distribute new sterile syringes along with much more. I'm gonna, just going to talk about, um, when we talk about syringes, it's really important to think about 
using terms like new and sterile instead of clean um, and then used instead of dirty. So um, trying to eliminate words such as clean and dirty from our vocabulary is really important in reducing the stigma around substance use disorder and um, harm reduction in general. So um, just be patient with yourself. If, if you are still working on changing your ter terminology, the most important thing is that you just work on it and do it. So um, I've been working on it too, because I was on a treatment court team. We'd always talk about clean urine, dirty urine, um, drug screens, stuff like that. So um, they also, um, harm reduction agencies and syringe access programs also um, can distribute tools used to prepare drugs so that they are not um, um, causing harm. They offer HIV and HCV testing, hand out naloxone and fentanyl test strips, um, and offer connection to treatment and recovery. In some cases, they also, also offer medical screenings and can help with wound care. Um, the benefits of syringe access programs are significant. Per the CDC, so Center for Disease Control and Prevention, um, one of our public health authorities in the United States, um, syringe access programs save lives by reducing the risk of overdose. They are associated with a 50% decline in HIV transmission. Um, and that is significant, not just for a person's life and um, quality of life, but for the cost of the medical care system and cost in general. HIV is very expensive to treat. Um, users of syringe access programs are three times more likely to stop injecting drugs. And then there's benefits for law enforcement, a reduced risk of needle stick, um, reduced levels of crime and lives saved. We also know that this reduces the syringes that are found in parks, sidewalks in the community compared to cities that don't have them. Um, and it, um, additional research findings and those studies are cited below. Um, one study found that syringe service are not just um, associated with lower rates of HIV, but also hepatitis. Um, people who inject drugs and um, use syringe service providers are five times more likely to enter treatment than those that don't, and they reduce healthcare costs by preventing HIV and HCV, HCV infections as well as overdose. So um, that is syringe service. Um, another quick pause. Any questions about either of these? All right, we're going to oh, go ahead. No questions. Sorry. Okay. Okay, next we're gonna talk about fentanyl test strips. So this is something that um, that we have more experience with over the last couple of years. So Mary Jo and I are on a couple of different projects um, with the community where um, we're finding the value of fentanyl test strips. People are um, finding that um, testing their drug supply for fentanyl is very useful in um, changing their drug use patterns. Um, we have found it helpful in proving to people. <laughs> we have one colleague who, um, was telling her friends, like, you better stop, you better have naloxone. Like, even if you're a meth user, there sure could be fentanyl in your drug supply. And they're like, oh, no, no, I trust my dealer. There's not going to be fentanyl in my drug supply. Well, lo and behold, she tested their drug supply and there was fentanyl in it. So, um, so basically, it's for detecting fentanyl um, and they can be repurposed. Um, to so they're made for testing urine, but they can be reused to detect fentanyl and other analogs. So um, it is important when you're using these. Um, there's called the chocolate chip cookie effect where um, you can Google that too, but basically um, you wanna try to mix up the drug to make sure that you're not testing the, the part of the drug that doesn't have the fentanyl. So the fentanyl can be in little tiny chocolate chip cookie effects within the larger cookie, if that makes sense. So um, there's techniques for, for doing this. Um, they are in, inexpensive and sensitive tests, so they're about a dollar per package. Um, they can't detect all the analogs and um, so training is important. But the benefits, um, we know that more and more of the street drug supply contains fentanyl, and so we just don't know. Um, it's important for people to know if it, their drug supply has it. Um, test strips and proper education can help people to avoid life-threatening overdoses, and they might be less useful in areas where people just assume that fentanyl's in the drug supply anyway. Um, another harm re reduction strategy um, is supervised consumption sites. Um, so this is another one that is evidence-based and yet it's a little controversial because we're like, ooh, I don't know if we like that. That sounds like we're encouraging substance use, um, but the evidence is there for them. So these are sites for people um, who inject drugs to do so safely under supervised trained personnel. Um, having this, these facilities does not make people more likely to use drugs. Um, it just um, supports the people who are going to use drugs anyway. So again, it fits under that general harm reduction definition. Like how do we reduce the harms associated with the things that people are going to do? <laughs> um, they're found to reduce volume of discarded syringes in the community, increasing connections between people who inject drugs and healthcare providers, save the healthcare system money based on HIV prevention alone. Um, there's over hundred sites in 11 different countries. So quite a few in Canada. 
um, Portugal, I think. Um, there are a few in the United States. So there's one in New York, one in Rhode Island. Um, we have some conversations about setting one up in Duluth. Um, it just uh, is a lot of work to try to figure out how to um, do that. So another strategy is um, decriminalization. So this is when we try to minimize social exclusion of people who use drugs and create a climate where they're less fearful of seeking and accessing treatment. Um, so Portugal is always the country everyone looks to. Um, they decriminalized illicit drugs in small amounts in 2001. And what they found was a reduction in the number of recent and current drug users, um, the reduction in new HIV infections, and a reduction in new um, drug-induced deaths. So the data also supported that. Now the important point here is decriminalization is not the same as legalization. So decriminalization removes criminal penalties for use in possession versus legalization removes criminal and civil penalties um, for use in possession. And then decriminalization is where the police give tickets for possession and they make arrests if the tickets aren't paid versus legalization would be like how New Jersey regulates and taxes marijuana just like alcohol. So um, that's just one difference. Um, so this is kind of the end of our overview of um, harm reduction, um, some different practices. One thing that's kind of new we didn't add in here, but there are also xylazine test strips, just like fentanyl test strips that are on the market now. Um, these have been in higher demand recently. Um, unfortunately, they're not legal currently <laughs> in the state of Minnesota. Um, I found that out after I ordered them. Um, they are. Um, you know, I think the exception is independent sovereign tribal nations, of course, they have their own government systems. And so um, I know tribes can use them without the same sort of scrutiny, but there are, there has been a change in laws where they will be legal, I think, as of August. So that is another tool that we have for um, communities to use to test their drug supply to try to save people's lives. So um, that's the end of my formal presentation, but I'm happy to take questions um, or comments or um, just hear from all of you that are in this meeting with us.